So I want to give everyone a chance to uh, get food and get to their seats, but I also want to give uh, Dr. Swan enough time to get through her talk. So I'll uh, give a short introduction while we're all getting to our seats now. But So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Debbie Swan, who's coming over from the VA to give grand rounds today. And I've known Debbie since I was a resident, and many people in this room, I assume, know Debbie, but for those who don't, she came to the UW from Iowa uh, in 1992 to do a Grec Fellowship, and she stayed there since, uh, and has uh, really, looking over her CV, been very productive and really a very active member of both the, the, the Grec, doing research on uh, dementia, and then also with the MIREC and other uh, psychiatric services at the VA doing research on schizophrenia. So uh, she became a full percent professor in 2009, but she also has uh, adjunct appointments in the Division of Medical Genetics and the Department of Epidemiology, where she's also an adjunct professor. She has over 100 publications, and in recent years she has dozens of publications um, as part of the Alzheimer's Disease uh, Genetics Consortium and also the Consortium on the Genetics of Schizophrenia. So these two large multi-center, multi-nation, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, sort of yeah. you know, programs that are looking at the genetics of these very complicated diseases. A couple titles that caught my eye is that she looks at things like um, levels of A-beta and other things in the CSF and how they impact dementia. She's looked at things like paternal age and schizophrenia, and then also things like the NMDA receptor in schizophrenia. So lots of things, and I'm very excited to hear what she talks to us about today. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Can everybody hear me okay? And online, I don't know what you're hearing. So, um, so it's my pleasure, obviously, to speak to you today. And... Um, before, and it was very hard to get here from the VA. I'm just kidding. So um, this is the outline of my talk today. And actually, before I start into the content, I'd like a couple people to tell me what is genomic medicine, or what's your understanding of genomic medicine. Anyone want to venture or get a couple educated answers? There's no right or wrong. You're not going to get scored. Okay, everybody's busy uh, eating. <laughs> okay, so the answer, one of the um, participants who's brave enough to answer said that uh, using genomic information to uh, inform treatment decisions. And I think that is actually very right on. So I will talk about, um, give you some background on genomic medicine. Um, the second point, I'll talk a little bit about research applications. Thirdly, I will talk about some clinical applications that you may find relevant to your patients that you see. And then finally, I will talk about the future. So, have you seen this Time Magazine cover? So, there's a lot of media hype about genomics. And this is a Time article that uh, the cover page say, want to know my future. And so it suggests that by doing genetic tests, we could see if this baby's uh, at risk for cancer, asthma, autism, and the whole spectrum of different conditions. So this has now become the expectation and actually, when I was in medical genetics clinic as a fellow, we actually had parents coming in requesting for us to sequence their sick child's entire genome. All right, so more about that later. As you may observe in your everyday life, there's variations in the food we eat. Right? I mean, the big tomato, the little tomato. And I'm not going to do plant genetics today. You have to take a course at the university for that, that information. But what's more fascinating, obviously, to um, us uh, clinicians is human variation. Who is this? 
Yeah. Out loud, please. Yes. And who's this? Yeah, that's right. So they share 99.9% .9 of their DNA in sequences. But they look phenotypically extremely different. So we're not going to talk about normal variation today. And as uh, Paul alluded to, I, my, I'm funded to do schizophrenia genetics research. So that's what I will focus mostly on today. But I, I think you'll find that it, um, the n other neuropsychiatric disorders have similar characteristics as what I'm going to talk about. But before I do that, I'd like to just give you a brief history on the genetics. So in April 1953, human genetics. So the, April 1953, the molecular structure of the nucleic acid was published by Watson and Crick. Any of you remember that? <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, you're 20, right? So in utero, you read that. So then next, February 2001, Nature and Science both published the draft of the human genome. Now, how many of you remember this? OK. And then in April 2008, the full sequence of the human genome was published. How many of you remember this? OK, great. Yeah, so from 53 to 2001, obviously a long time before the draft, so the draft of the human genome, what that means is the mile markers. So if you're driving down the highway, right, you see the mile markers. So that's what the draft means. It's not every single base pair of the 3 billion base pair, but that it is, we know where the anchors are, OK? Now, going to the 2008 publication, this is the full sequence of the uh, one human genome. And subsequently, many human genomes have been sequenced. So does that make sense? So that's every single base pair of the 3 billion base pair was sequenced in 2008. So as I mentioned, my main first topic is what is genomic medicine. And to talk about that, we need to know how many genes are in the human genome. And so currently, the estimate is 21,000 genes in the 3 billion base pairs. So that's many, that's far fewer than initially anticipated, because at first we thought there were 100,000 genes. About 50% of the genes have an unknown function. So that's a very uh, large percentage. And it actually makes up less than 2% of the total genome. And as you think back to biology, genes are the ones that code protein. Who remembers undergrad biology? Yeah, blacking it out, out of your hippocampus, right? So, um, but, uh, so it's actually a very small percentage of the total genome. And then what's been exciting since the sequencing of the genomes is that even though the 98% of the genome and the, this is what we used to call in medical school junk DNA, right? Some of you are nodding your heads remembering that. But actually, very important functions lie in this part of the DNA. It's called non-coding, but these regions can include regulatory sequences that turn off and on genes. However, this area includes a lot of repetitive sequences, like I show here, like AG, AG, AG. So then it becomes difficult and challenging when we're talking about sequencing. So uh, this is a, gra uh, um, a figure talking about the development of genetic technologies. So in the 1980s, that was when the first linkage map was developed. 
And then some of you may remember working on restriction fragment link polymorphisms. Yes? No? Perhaps? And then in the 90s, we moved through building and building for the draft of the human genome. And I remember in the 90s, when I first came here, uh, we were doing 382 RFLP markers for schizophrenia to do linkage in families. And that took almost two years to do 386 markers. But that was considered dense coverage at this time. So can you see how far we have moved and how fast we have moved? With the first GWAS that was published in 2002, do you all know what a GWAS is? OK, so it's basically those row markers that are polymorphic or that are different between individuals. And we can currently, the recent GWASs have been uh, genotyping about two to three million of those row markers. So you get these uh, markers that you could do genetic association studies. So. Those are called, um, the markers in GWAS studies are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. But just because a single nucleotide polymorphism is associated with a disease does not, does not mean that's a disease causing SNP. Okay? So when you read about GWASs, that's just one thing to keep in mind. And then in the We've been working on, or the field's been working on next sequencing and specifically next generation sequencing. And what that means is high throughput sequencing that you could do, uh, you could sequence maybe 10 to 12 people at one time, and you could do the 3 billion base pairs. And that takes, that's been the times and short, uh, shortening as far as that kind of technology. And this is just a, um, a little diagram to show uh, how DNA sequencing, this is the cap, the, um, the, I can't remember what this is anymore because we don't read these anymore. We read um, nucleotides like this, okay, in colors. And then this is a next generation sequencer. And so most lab can this, do this work automated. And most labs could turn around, depending on if it's a commercial lab, they could usually turn this around in a couple weeks to give you all, your whole sequence. So that's pretty amazing, right? From two years, 20 years ago, um, just 386 markers to 3 billion base pairs. So because uh, the Many NIH institutes have been have committed sufficient su substantial amount of funds into sequencing. There's three basic types of human variations that are known. Now these are not disease individuals per se. So most of them are called base pair substitutions, and I will give you a little bit more information about that. And then the next most common are called indels, and I'll give you more uh, illustration. And then the, uh, the smallest part of this kind of human variation is what we call large rearrangements. So uh, for, this is an example of single base pair substitutions. And, and please memorize this, because you'll be quizzed at the end. Just kidding. So this is a pre in one gene that causes early onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, and what I just wanted to show you is some of these blue dots, those are mutations that almost certainly causes disease. But the other point is there's over 150 known variants in this gene that can cause early onset Alzheimer's disease. So this is a, one of these base pair changes is an example of a single base pair substitution. Now, genetic variations are like misspelled words 
in a set of encyclopedia. So we may know what chromosome something is on. So that's like volume seven. And we may know through other studies like linkage analysis, the region that a disease gene might be on. And then the actual gene could be looked at as a sentence in a paragraph. And then the single base pair change is, for example, one uh, letter being changed. So instead of reading this is a sentence in a paragraph, this, this uh, I can't even read this, this is a sentence in a paragraph. So that's the nucleotide change. And nucleotide change could have different, different consequences, as you know, depending on if it uh, um, just changes to another base pair or if it happens and becomes a codon that ends in the termination of the protein. So obviously, the termination of a protein production will have much more um, uh, adverse consequences than one that changes the, the amino acid. So the second type of human variation are called indels. And these are small, like 1 to 10,000 base pair insertions or deletions. And there are some examples of disease causing coding. So again, coding occurs in the protein coding region or in an exon. Um, for example, in mature onset diabetes of the young, there's a gene, there's a gene called CEL, and indels in this gene, it has been reported with M MODI, as it's called. So we haven't specifically found any indels associated with psychiatric conditions, but I think as we move ahead in the um, analysis of the massive amount of data that's available, um, something will come up. As the, because the, many of people who have been sequenced have not been thoroughly examined by one of you to know what their psychiatric phenotype is. So many of these initial sequences come from cohorts that are studying heart <laughs> disease or they're studying um, diabetes or something else. So we don't know the, what their psychiatric phenotype may be. So there is one recent study that just came out in 2014 that did show some exonic indels are excessively represented with children affected in autism. Um, but I want to just caution you on all association studies that um, these are aggregate data and this doesn't necessarily point a finger to specific indels. So just another illustration going back to the encyclopedia representation of indels. And I'm going to go through this a little faster. So basically on the bottom here, we have this word not inserted. So that's an insertion. And then if it's crossed out, that's a deletion. And then duplication, it's repeated. OK, so number three uh, type of human variation is called large arrangements or structural variations. Another name that's called is copy number polymorphisms. And I think this is the area that has gained a lot of attention in psychiatric disorders. Um, and for example, this is a, a cytogenetic study that shows that on chromosome 16, there's a duplication of segment of a, uh, in, in an autistic patient. So in autism, there's a, a been a handful of cytogenetic rearrangements, or actually, I should say, structural variations that have been associated. Again, these are rare, so it's not necessarily, you don't want to necessarily go and order this test for your patients. So let's move on to the second topic, uh, global topic of research applications. And I think one thing that's very important when we uh, design research studies, we have to think about common variant versus rare variant <laughs> hypothesis. So you, only you know the condition that you're studying the best. So a common disease, common variant hypothesis is, is what GWASs are based on. 
And so the assumption is that the genetic variation is due to relatively few common variants. So common variants are variants that occur in more than 10% of the general population. And, but the problem with these alleles is they're low penetrance. So if you have one copy of this kind of allele, it may not, it, there's no one-to-one -one direct correlation with disease. And then um, you may have to have a combination of alleles to become disease. And then the other uh, limitations is that small effect size. On the other hand, the uh, other hypothesis is the common disease rare variant hypothesis. So these are um, maybe, for example, in autism, there's uh, many different kinds, subtypes of autism, but each could be caused by a rare allele. And with rare alleles, you get high penetrance, which means if you have the allele, you will most likely develop disease. However, there's genetic heterogeneity, and, and but the good thing is the effect sizes are large. And the best example of this actually in one disease is Alzheimer's disease, where you have the common allele, I mean, not the common allele, the rare variant, like the PS2, PS1, APP mutations. But on the other hand, you have APOE, which is a, a common variant, E4 allele, that can also increase disease. You're frowning. You want to tell me why or, or not? Yeah, you're saying there's two separate causes. One is a CDCV, which yes. is APO, and the other is, is a CD. Yeah, so okay. the, the comment was that there's two common causes. Groups, general groups of causes, OK? So this is what happens when you sit in the front row. <laughs> I can see your facial expressions. So anyway, so like I said, common diseases, like Alzheimer's disease, can have many different causes. And it is my belief that we will find causes for this. Um, for example, when you think about pneumonia back maybe in the early 1900s, the symptoms are totally the same, right? Ca well, not totally, but coughing, um, spe uh, spe productive sputum. But we didn't know what the potential causes of um, pneumonia is. And that's where we are, I believe, in psychiatric disorders. We don't know specific ideologies. And I believe that once we could get a handle, and this has happened in Alzheimer's disease, once APP mutations were discovered, even though it's rare, it helped us to lead us to the amyloid hypothesis for to be associated with Alzheimer's disease. So even though mutations are rare, they could give us clues in the disease of interest. OK, so again, this is um, a schematic showing the association or the relationship between very frequency and disease characteristics. So the, the ones that are what we consider low-hanging fruit are the Mendelian diseases. So you could tell the transmission from generation to generation because the penetrance is high. And many of these diseases have been um, discovered through the standard linkage analysis, like using the 368 markers. Um, Huntington's disease was able to be pinpoint, the region of Huntington's disease. But it took another 10 years before the actual gene was identified. And so um, when we think about the most variants that are identified by the GWAS genetic association studies, they're, on the other hand, on this end of the uh, graph. So they're common in allele frequency, and their penetrance is low. So it's going to be much harder to do gene identification if you have a common allele frequency and low penetrance. So these are the kinds of things we conceptually think about and hypothesize. Obviously, we're not going to know where the gene is before we, or genes are, before we start doing uh, our work. But this kind of gives you a, uh, a kind of um, framework to build studies on. And basically, this slide is just telling you if the genetic relative risk is low, so low is 1.25 here. For this very um, this purple line, you're going to need large sample sizes to get effects. And this is what we have seen with the GWASs. They're all going for 100,000 cases and controls. 
So can you see that many patients in your lifetime? No. So that's why we have, we're involved with like the Alzheimer's disease genetic consortium in multi-center across the US and now with Europe collaborations. And the results have been very interesting. However, um, they're genes that are small effect and you can't use it to diagnose anybody. <coughs> so this is another issue that is often confronted in GWAS studies. So basically, the ethnicity and mixture in individuals uh, vary. So this is a principal component analysis. And this is one of the first analytic strategies that's usually done after cleaning data. And I just wanted to show you that even though within European population, people are outliers, this is actually an Ashkenazi Jewish population. And I hope no one's Swedish, but you're out here. All right. So anyway, th these are all potential confounders in ge genetic association studies, the ethnicity, because we know so much more about it. Um, and then, of course, I, I, am a gen I am a believer in genetics. However, the environment plays a role. So with any disease or phenotype, it generates certain kind of behaviors, and then that interacts with their environment, and then genetics plays a role. So it's obviously very complicated, and I'm, well, fortunately for my patients, but unfortunately for me, I can't lock them up in a cage. I, I didn't say this, don't, no, nobody report this to the IRB, because it, this does not happen, okay? <laughs> So, but w that means we need a large enough sample size to control for all the possible confounders. Go ahead. What about the certainty of whether a person actually has a given phenotype or not? Some phenotypes are pretty easy to get universal agreement mm -hmm. on, and others, like, like some certain psychiatric disorders, there'd be disagreement. Okay, so the question is, what about the phenotypes? Does that mess with your... I, actually, I thought psychiatrists are always right. And, so and that we always agree. No. Your life is hard. My life is hard. So is yours. Does that also make the, the life of a... Yeah, yeah. I, I will address some of that. The signal's not clear. Yes, the signal isn't clear. The, the comment is the signal isn't clear. And I think that is one issue. Um, we, given that we do have the DSM system to try to come to consensus, um, there's obviously weakness, uh, limitations to the diagnostic systems we have. But yeah, I, I, that's been a challenge in human genetics and or psychiatric genetics in the last 20 years is we're not sure how the phenotypes correlate with the genotype. So that's obviously a limitation. So add that to this pie or this rectangle. So you have work to do. That, that's a joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let me just move ahead and uh, tell you a little bit about, Paul mentioned the, um, some of the sequencing work that we've done in schizophrenia. And this is an example of a research application. I was funded by the brain behavior, uh, they used to call it NARSAD, but it's now a different uh, name. But I've been, I was funded with them to do um, whole exome sequencing in schizophrenia. So that's, what that means is taking the, uh, just sequencing the exons or the coding, coding elements. And we uh, obtained families from the National Institute of Mental Health. And for those of you who aren't used to reading pedigrees, um, the circles are the girls and the squares are the male. So, and the black means they're affected. So in this family, we had five schizophrenic patients, one, two, and but looking at this, even though we could say this pedigree schizophrenia is likely familial, we cannot comment on the mode of inheritance clearly because we don't. We usually like to have three or four generations passing down. So we have two generations here, which is good for schizophrenia, but we don't have four generations to clearly comment on the mode of inheritance. However, we're not uh, we're not going to be daunted by that. So we proceeded, 
And so the first thing we did was at that time there was a, when we started this project, there was a substantial report about copy number variations or the structural variations that I uh, talked about. Basically, um, we, so we knew we had to screen that to make sure there's no structural variations. And don't, don't squint too much. This is not actually, this is actual data, but basically it's to tell you we did not find structural variations in our families. Uh, the next thing we did was this is called next the as I mentioned before next generation sequencing. So in a nutshell, what you're doing is breaking apart genomic DNA, so they're fragments, and then you hybridize them with uh, um, uh, segments that are fluorescent to capture them. So only complementary segments can uh, align to each other, and then you wash and the, uh, the captured DNA you pull it through DNA sequencing and then you could map and align and do variant calling. So typically these days we're actually trying to get about 90 times mapped. 90 of these segments to our, our fluorescent um, to map. Okay, so, uh, this may be, I, don't, I probably don't have time to go through this, all right? So basically you're capturing DNA. And what we did was we did variant filtering and so found that there were about, you know, 10,000 to about 20,000 variants that were shared, that were unique and share with between the family members. And then of those, we wanted to focus on ones that could cause protein change. So then that filtered out uh, a majority of the variants. And then we hypothesized that these would be rare variants. So that filtered out um, a uh, a substantial number of other variants. And then we landed on 22 unique variants that were identified. Um, and uh, to our <coughs> happiness, I would say, we found a novel GRM5 missense mutation, um, G369V was presented was present in four affected members of one of our pedigrees, and this was validated by Sanger sequencing. And um, some of you are glutamate experts here, so I, I um, don't want to elaborate on this, but basically activation of the mglu R5 enhances NMDA receptor signaling. And um, so this, this GRM5 has previously in, implicated in schizophrenia, and you could read this, it's neurotranslocation, it's associated with schizophrenia in case control studies, and there's been functional work that has been done in animal models um, that show that there's deficiency of this receptor in mice can produce behavioral changes that are characteristic of schizophrenia. Um, just another schematic of the GRM5 uh, receptor signaling and with the downstream effects of synaptic, uh, affecting synaptic transmission, development, and plasticity. And obviously this, this makes us uh, think that this is a good uh, candidate for schizophrenia. However, I'm going to skip this because um, basically we have not, since we published this, no one else has found families that have this mutations in this gene. So that makes me not so happy because in science we want to replicate, replicate, and replicate. So we haven't uh, uh, done additional functional work in this uh, gene because of that. And so basically there's a lot of other strategies that is going on right now and at the end of the talk, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about what's going on at the U U University of Washington. Clinically, there, there are now multi-gene panels that we could get for Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. So um, this is very exciting. That just came out in January. So we can actually order these tests. And so the third topic I'm, I is called personalized medicine is now moving to precision medicine. And if you look at NIH website, this is all the talk now, is precision medicine. So you might ask, what is precision medicine? So that is uh, incorporating genetics, 
in, and genetics changes the lifestyle and environment and then the interactions between these three components. Okay, so it's complicated, um, but the best area or field that is able to apply some of these strategies clinically is actually cancer genetics. And in cancer, you have accessible tissue, the tumor that one can biopsy. And it is now standard to uh, determine the specific mutation that is the, it, that the tumor ha has, or the somatic mutation, and target treatment specifically to the tumor. So this is what precision medicine in oncology looks like in globally right now, is a patient with a specific kind of cancer. There's a diagnostic test, uh, for example, a panel of cancer genes, and that tumor undergoes this kind of screening, picks up the people who are likely to benefit for a treatment that's targeted to that specific gene, and then these are likely more likely to be the people that benefit from treatment. On the other hand, the people who are diagnostic test negative are most likely going to be unresponsive to treatment because we don't know what their specific ideology is. So this is, again, just very broad sweep. So um, the clinical applications, and uh, these are traditional considerations. So is the disease familial? Are there known pathogenic genes associated with this disease? Is there treatment available? What are the implications of testing positive, implications of testing negative, and what are the pitfalls? Now, I have examples for every single one of these, but I think because of time, I'm going to have to kind of skirt this and get to the bottom line. So if you see a lot of slides going past, it is not your eyes. So this, this actually point addressed to your question about phenotype, because in this pedigree, that uh, schizophrenic family that we had, we had schizophrenia, schizoaffective depressed, we had schizotypal, and then we had substance abuse. So what is the familial disease in this family? And that is critical, actually, when you do genetic studies. Could yeah. be their environment. Well, right. So one of the comments that it could be environment. What's that? I didn't hear you, John. He said schizotypy. Schizotypal. Schizotypy, he said. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a concept, too. We, that, there could be a whole another talk about that, too. Okay, I, I can't take any questions now, okay? <laughs> Till the end! And then you could stay. I will stay and answer questions because I just want to get through some of the most important points. And then are there known pathogenic genes associated with schizophrenia? So last year, this was published, Biological Insights from 108 Schizophrenia-Associated Genetic Loci. This year, this was published, Uncovering the Hidden Risk Architecture of the Schizophrenia, Confirmation Three Independent Genome-Wide Association Studies. And the quote from the senior author was, schizophrenia is made up of eight specific genetic disorders. And while I'm very excited about all these findings, again, these are not what you're going to take to the clinic. Aggregate findings, don't be ordering tests on your patients to do the schizophrenia genetic loading. And especially don't be taking their children because they want to know what are, if they're at risk. Those are all very complicated questions when you take these research findings into the clinical. So is treatment available? So in psychiatry, uh, treatment targets symptoms. And improvements are observed, but usually not cures. And side effects can be problematic, hit and miss. So vision of pharmacogenomics is, uh, again, as I alluded to in the past, that we could um, analyze somebody's DNA and determine if they're going to be a seroquel responder or they're going to be an aripiprazole responder. <coughs> Alternatively, are they going to have metabolic side effects to one of the atypicals? 
So this is where I think we're moving. And there are already some commercial labs that could do some of this testing, but I'm not convinced they have tested in a representative sample to give a definitive answer. So we don't use this clinically yet. So then what are the implications of testing positive? And because this isn't so applicable in psychiatry now, I don't, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. So, and these are the different kinds of genetic tests. There's diagnostic testing in people who are symptomatic. There's predictive genetic testing. And then public opinion surveys on genetic testing when the Huntington's gene uh, test came out is even though individuals at risk for uh, Huntington's disease, 40 to 79% of them express an intention to go undergo genetic testing when it's actually available, only 10 to 20% actually request testing when offered. So in psychiatric disorders, we're going to have, you're at 10%, 20%, 30%, 70% of developing schizophrenia, autism, bipolar disorder. How are you going to explain that to your patients? And I think the, this slide is to show that the, some of the, how we have to start with this kind of discussion. Are you talking to a glass half full patient or a glass half empty patient? And that will get, sort of help you think about these probabilities. And then what are the implications of testing negative? So the waiting period could be uh, traumatic. And when I did um, medical genetics fellowship with Dr. Bird there, um, survival guilt for people that didn't test positive with Huntington's disease because their siblings had it and they knew they had escaped the, the fate. So let's talk about what we could do now, all right? So applications in psychiatric disorders, the clinician is extremely important, obviously. So you could take a family history. You could take an environmental assessment, including family interactions. You could look at their personality, lifestyle risk factors. And lifestyle risk factors are actually modifiable. But you've got to find the carrot for the patient, right, of what's going to change their behavior. And then recurrence risk information is available for, from years of epidemiology studies in almost every single psychiatric disorder. We have to understand that this, our disorders are not Mendelian, so they're not going to be transmitted in a recessive or dominant fashion. And then also be very careful about using any kind of GWAS uh, genetic likelihood markers to predict or diagnose psychiatric conditions. We still need to be diligent in our diagnostic skills. And then education intervention is necessary. And I just like to go back to, you know, people wanting 100, the geneticists wanting 100,000 cases and controls. Okay, even though I can't provide that many, I'd like to say, you know, I feel confident in the 100 Alzheimer's patients I've contributed to the sample. So clinicians, don't give up, all right? And don't, don't let the geneticists tell you that you're not important. Oh, but I'm having a little transference issues, okay, <laughs> or counter-transference. Anyway, so the, this is the kind of data that's available for, for schizophrenia. And this is published information already that in one of our books. So this is something that I use, use usually when a person comes in wanting to know recurrence risk for their um, potential offspring or their siblings, et cetera. Okay? So we don't go straight to genetic testing. Um, and then what are the pitfalls? So actually, the pitfalls is there too many variants right now. An average person's whole genome sequencing has over 3.5 million variants that are different from the reference genome. And 0.6 million of these are rare or novel. And 400 genes have rare or novel variants. So how do we make sense of this? 
And then that's why I want to loop back to the parents who came in asking us to do genome sequencing. Yes, we could do it. The technology is available, but how do we interpret it? Because that's ultimately what they're interested in, is interpretation. So this is a recent uh, paper that was published, and it's actionable exo exo exomic. Exo exomes are essentially all the genomes, uh, all the exons, OK? Incidental finding in 6,503 participants, the challenges of variant identification. And this is actually a UW group um, that's uh, senior authors, Debbie Nickerson and Gail Jarvik. And of this, we're just looking at variants in the exon. We're not talking about even those outside, which is the majority, OK? Just, uh, and just focusing on 112 genes. And you see the highest bar is this um, light blue one which shows that 395 variants are of uncertain significance. And then in this group of um, individuals, there's 29 pathogenic mutations. And this could be pathogenic for cystic fibrosis, um, for uh, Crohn's disease, Huntington's disease. It could be something along that line. That has been reported in the literature. And then because of the vast amount of um, sequencing data available, last year the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics came up with guidelines for clinical sequencing. So this is not research testing, but for because people uh, are, uh, clinicians are actually are ordering clinical exomes. So a person comes in with undiagnosed um, or not undiagnosed, but a specific kind of colon cancer, let's say. And there's actually a study going on at the U on colon cancer um, genomics. And then uh, the, the guidelines are as such that constitutional mutations, basically mutations in uh, coding regions, must be reported. And the minimum set of genes established last year is 50. And these are the more, the mutations like uh, breast cancer, mutations that there something could be done about, for example, in screening. And then the thing I think is critical is the pre and post testing counseling is the responsibility of the clinician. And then this list subsequently, this list, list of 50 genes right now have to be updated annually. And this takes a lot of time, obviously, in curation of all the variants in genes. And currently, the bottleneck is actually in the bioinformatics and the interpretation part. There's so much data coming in. But it's due to, up to the lab, which processes the data, to call it, and then the clinician to help the patient interpret. And again, are you talking to a patient who you have to assess their understanding of their disease, their impact, and there's a lot of individualized um, uh, counseling sessions that have to happen. And then there is direct-to-consumer testing now, and you see them online, on the billboards, on the EO everywhere. And what is usually collected are saliva samples. What is included is typically subsets of genes. And how much is, quote, free to a few hundred thousand dollars. And then some of the sites that are better have genetic counselors available um, to, that, to talk to, but others don't. So this is just something that's coming down the pipeline. I think for all of you who see patients, you, you're going to have to be aware of this. And I think um, the National Institute is planning on um, more education sessions for clinicians to help us deal with this massive amount of information that be coming down our, our way. And then I just the last section of this talk is that the future is here. 
Uh, I'm really excited about what's coming in. And our university has a huge group in genome sciences, medical genetics, who is publishing papers on neuropsychiatric disorders in the dyslexia field, the syndromic autism and intellectual disability field, and schizophrenia. So we're, we are very fortunate to be at an institution that has so much genomic work in the front lines. And then um, you could look on this online. Gene Tests is a website. Um, and there's 43,669 tests that are available now. And you could see the exponential growth of the types of tests that are available. And I just clicked on this just to see what showed up. There's an aut autism multi-gene panel. We're going to send your, blood, your saliva or blood to Poland. And I, I'm not, say, not making a judgment, okay? But there's a lot of labs doing uh, a lot of different genetic testing. And this, this website does not necessarily vet the bioinformatics or the um, interpretation, but they're merely listing labs that offer specific tests. But it will be up to you as a clinician to help people interpret, or even to decide if this is relevant for them. And then lastly, this is what's available at the University of Washington. And this slide is available. There's a precision medicine division now in the, laboratory, uh, in the uh, pathology department at the UW. And testing is, and these are what we consider CLIA certified. That's a CLIA lab. So the results can be given back to um, the patients. And Dr. Bird and uh, Dr. Zabadian, both in the GREC, um, we worked pretty hard on getting the list of genes together. And these are mostly rare mutations. So again, not to use in uh, the common, what we call common variety, um, Alzheimer's disease. So I think I'm going to end there and um, take a few questions. So go ahead. I assume it's chances that uh, with the relatively few genes that end up being in the human genome, that a lot of the variation might be due to non-sequence stuff in the genome. So things like DNA methylation, RNAi, et cetera, et cetera. Is it possible that with these complex disorders like schizophrenia that, that the biggest impact is actually not coming from sequence changes? Yes. So how the, do you address that? Yeah, so the question is, um, it is likely, or is it possible, that many of the changes are not in the coding regions, but in the non-coding regions for the neuropsychiatric? Well, not in the code at all, but in other aspects. Well, sure, sure, in the regulatory regions. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work going on in epigenetics in every single psychiatric disorder. And the, the issue and challenge with epigenetics is that environment changes epigenetics. So the profile could change um, depending on if somebody exercised in the morning, or they smoked, or they ate. So it becomes another layer of complexity. And certainly, that's where um, things are moving, because we're finding fewer coding mutations than people are, uh, scientists are now, investigators are now moving on to epigenetic. So in every single psychiatric disorder, almost, there's now movement towards studying epigenetics. So do we have any um, questions from the audience? The, I'm, I'm sorry, the online audience. I don't see uh, comments, per se. Are there any questions that I'm not reading? So go ahead, Enrique. So testing, uh, in terms of autism, for example, I mean, very little is known. So what, what's the, how, how is this being used, or what, 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 are you, what is your recommendation of clinicians being used? So the autism gene panel 
has about 50 genes that have had point mutations in it. So I have not actually ordered that test, but it is, for example, um, guidelines may be if they have a family history, if you have another person in the family that has autism. What we're, do, what we're using it for, for research purposes uh, is that we are actually, Tom Bird has many families that have multiple generation affected. And so if a person has autopsy proven Alzheimer's disease, we are trying to assess if there's specific genes that are affected in those individuals. Obviously, in autism, because we don't have a, quote, definitive diagnosis, it's a little harder. But I think um, as the research push on forward, it will become clear. Now, the only other situation for autism that may be relevant are copy number variations. Because I think there's about five structural variations that have been, they're rare, but they've been shown to be associated with autism. So that would be the very first thing I would think about instead of going after point mutations. There's a question up here. Oh, can you read it for me? Oh, yeah. So David Harrison asks, can insurance companies ask for documentation of family history of mental illness? And can insurance companies ask who in the family is the carrier? OK, I guess I have to repeat that online. So thank you. So the question is, can insurance camp companies ask for documentation of family history of mental illnesses? So I think the last time I filled out an insurance form, there was a question about family history of dementia. So I think I, I'm not a regulation expert. So Tom, do you know if uh, I, I believe? I, I interpret this as two quite very different kinds of questions. The first one is uh, you know, whether they're going to pay for a test or not. So you know, what is the strength of <laughs> Uh, implication for actually using this test. You know, if you got a positive family history, maybe you're, you're more likely to get a positive test. So they want, they want to know whether it makes any sense for them to pay for the test. Yeah. The other. Okay, pa, Tom, I'm going to have to repeat that. So um, uh, Dr. Bird, who is in the audience, who has been a uh, neurogeneticist for 40 years. Uh, answer that um, the insurance companies may be interested in if you're going to develop a disease in the future because they want to know if they should cover you or not. Okay. And they certainly can ask those questions. There's no reason, no, no prohibition for them to ask it. So the, the second kind of question is can they use genetic information to deny you insurance and they find out if you're a carrier of some abnormal gene? Uh, and uh, for health, so it actually depends on the kind of insurance you're talking about. So for health insurance, so can can you wait a minute? Yeah, well, let me just say for health insurance, you cannot do that. So for health insurance, they cannot deny you health insurance based on your gene carrier status. That's a law, uh, the anti-genetic discrimination law. But for health insurance and long-term care insurance. No, you for just life, said, yeah, for you life, just, for life, disability, long-term care insurance, they, they can. can. That information to reject you yeah. your application. Basis. So they can reject your application on the basis of disability and for, for disability and life insurance. And that's why at the Alzheimer's Center, if somebody is interested in getting a genetic test because they have a lot of family members with genetic tests or uh, with a specific mutation, <laughs> We say to them, before you do that, think, uh, have you considered and evaluated your need for disability and life insurance? Because we may, if the insurance company asks us, we may need to re release that information. So, okay, that's a uh, very, that, that's another topic of itself because there's a lot of um, legal and ethical, social implications of genetic testing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.